you want me to turn off my camera? No, that's okay. No, leave it on. So we're started and it's recording. And so now we'll just, I usually wait like 30 seconds for people to file in just to get this where, where it needs to be. Okay. Okay, I'll get started. <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the fall 2023 Stair Little Turnbull Foundation lecture series at Lehman College, uh, where we meet with designers, artists, and other experts about the world of art and design. I'm David Schwittick. I'm Associate Professor of Design and Digital Media here in the Art Department at Lehman College. In this six-part series, we will explore the complex interplay of perspectives in the world of art and design specifically examining the gaze from various angles, particularly the male gaze and the emergent female gaze. Uh, just to define terms, the term male gaze as we understand it today was coined uh, by Laura Mulvey in her groundbreaking 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. It's long dominated representations of women in, in the world. It embodies a visual perspective where women are often objectified, positioned as subjects of desire, and frequently framed through the eyes of male artists and viewers. This historical lens has influenced countless artistic expressions, societal norms, and gender dynamics for centuries, really. At the same time, we're going to talk about and venture into the realm of the female gaze, which is an emergent perspective that challenges, subverts, and redefines the perceptional, percep I'm sorry, perceptional traditions. The female gaze empowers women to claim agency over their own representation, and reimagine how they're seen, valued, and portrayed. It disrupts conventional narratives and reclaims the right to self-expression. And to set the stage for all this, the Lehman College Art Gallery has installed a pretty remarkable exhibition entitled Framing the Female Gaze, which offers powerful insights into the diverse ways in which the female gaze has already begun to reshape our visual culture. This exhibition showcases the dynamic array of artists and their approaches, and it runs from, it actually opened last week, October 10th um, uh, to 2023 to January 20th, 2024. There's a reception next week uh, on the 18th from Fight. Uh, throughout this lecture series, we're, we're honored really to, to, to speak with distinguished speakers who shed light on the gaze from their own unique vantage points. They will share their experiences, thoughts, and creative journeys, and will offer diverse perspectives that are gonna help us understand this, this pretty critical topic. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I just wanna thank Dee Dunn from the Turnbull Foundation who made this all possible, as well as Bart Bland in the, uh, the gallery, Lehman College Art Gallery. Uh, and without further ado, our guest today is Benaz Ferrahi. She's trained as an architect. Benaz is a, an award-winning designer and a critical maker based in LA. She has a PhD in interdisciplinary media arts and practice from the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Currently, she's an assistant professor at the Department of Design at California State University in Long Beach. She explores how to foster an empathetic relationship between the human body and the space around it using computational systems. Her work addresses critical issues such as feminism, emotion, perception, and social interaction. Brahi has won several awards, including the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, Digital Design Award, Innovation by Design, Fast Company Award, World Technology Award. She's co-editor of an issue of AD, 3D Printed Body Architecture from 2017, and Interactive Design, which is forthcoming. Benaz, thank you so much for uh, meeting with us today. I, um, I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited to talk to you and talk about your work because it's there's a lot to unpack and it actually, um, the more I look at your work, the more I see how how deep in this idea of the gaze you really are. So welcome uh, and thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, David, for the great introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, do you see my screen? Yes, all clear. Perfect. Um, yes, it's a great honor to be here. This is uh, such a um, critical and important topics and I'm really uh, happy and delighted to be part of this uh, lecture series. 
So um, with that, I'm going to uh, start my presentation and showcase some of the work that I've done in the field, um, uh, critical computation, design, um, gaze and surveillance and, mm -hmm. and the use of AI. Um, working at the intersection of interactive, immersive, art, fashion, architecture, and as someone who is really fascinated by tactility, texture, and movement of materials, I've always been really interested to see how um, computational systems could be embedded into the substrate of materials. So materials become machines, machines become materials. Um, but perhaps a new kind of machines, I call them emotive machines or mm. emotive environments. What I mean by emotive environment, it's uh, environments that can foster a sense of empathy and connectedness that recognize and sense people's emotion and respond to that accordingly. The main inspiration in my work, in many cases, comes from the world of nature. Um, not only nature is beautiful in terms of its morphology and form, which is mesmerizing, um, but also it's in terms of its intelligence um, in responding to both internal as well as external stimuli. It is basically alive. I'm really interested to see how the environment, how the, the materials could become alive with intelligence in responding to social critical issues of our time. In this, um, I uh, do my research, uh, look at developments of new materials, materials that they're um, shape changing, that they're dynamic, that their texture and their forms constantly evolving and changing. I use a variety of computational uh, systems such, such as algorithmic design tools, 3D printing to develop materials with changes shape. Um, they activated using variety of activation system um, from conventional systems such as motor and servos to shape memory alloy, smart materials, um, and variety of soft robotic system to see how these materials can become alive. I also um, work at sensory technologies, um, basically, um, I wonder how we could give machine an eye for an eye um, to sense, to see us. And then the question we can ask is that, what does it mean to be observed by the machine? As we are especially immersed in the world of computer vision, machine learning algorithms and biometric sensors, we're constantly watched by these, um, in, by these technologies. So it could be, say that our emotions or um, our very uh, invisible layer of what you're sensing could be sensed and analyzed through these systems. I started exploring some of these ideas um, from uh, the architectural scales. I started building interactive installations such as series of interactive shape-changing um, uh, walls, um, installation, like installation that they're basically in the scale of architecture that they show how the environment can change color and textures. For instance, walls that respond to the spoken uh, words of the users, or this wall that responds to the hand gesture. The intention was really to sort of explore how the materials of the environments could become dynamic, physically change the shape, and respond in a reciprocal way to, to participants in the space. This is a robotic ceiling installation which responds to the movement of um, people on their knees. So as it sees people and the activity uh, of the people on their knees, uh, it physically changes its shape um, according to um, uh, people's activity and movement underneath the ceiling. But these ideas didn't just state in the world of architecture. I was very interested to see how some of these ideas, especially the use of new technologies, could be used around the human body as a form of wearable or a fashion item where um, these technology could enhance human perception, ways that we communicate with one another, or even our social interaction. 
This is a neuromorphic uh, helmet that responds to the brain activity of the wearer. So as the wearer thinks more or the attention level of the wearer increases, the helmet opens up and then um, the wearer uh, basically uh, attention level goes down, the, the, the helmet closes down and creates a cocoon around the head. I wonder if our variable could expand our sensory experience and influence our social interaction. This is uh, iridescence. Um, iridescence um, is, a, is a emotive color inspired by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are amazing creatures. They change the color of their feathers from mm, hot pink magenta to dark green with a twist of their head. So I was wondering how we could develop a material that they can change color and texture and shape uh, in a similar fashion and use as an expressive medium for communication. I was, uh, this project was commissioned by the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It's actually part of the permanent collection of the museum. Uh, so one of the challenge uh, was literally like how to develop uh, a sort of a system that is robust enough that I can run in the museum on a daily basis and basically every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So um, the idea was we built these mechanisms in-house with a team of people that I, I was working at the time. Um, obviously, this project went through lots of, uh, it was very labor intensive. It went through a lot of like iterative process to fine tune these mechanisms for uh, for movement. So basically, um, it consists of 200 independent components that they rotate in one axis, and then the color changing petals are located on top of each mod module, changing their colors as they flip from one side to another. Um, the design of this was really thinking about a modular system where if something breaks, we can easily provide extra uh, components for the museum staff so they can replace and, and um, replace it with the, with the new part. So these are electromagnetic actuators that they flip based on uh, magnetic force um, from one side to another. And then it was the process of um, uh, electrical um, uh, driver boards uh, developments with my collaborator um, and then as well as basically assembling all these parts. Um, so um, overall this piece had 200 moving components, 40 driver boards, one camera, four um, uh, microcontrollers and um, all basically embedded inside this piece that it was wearable. So it was like extreme uh, sort of um, uh, combination, mash of technology and art and, 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 and um, really seeing that how we can put this together as a robust system, which can run in the museum on a daily basis. Um, so this was a little, I wanted to share a little technical aspects of the piece. I mean, in terms of the interaction, the, the, the piece um, has a very small camera that it's embedded inside um, the piece. Um, the, the camera sees people um, and when it recognizes new faces, um, the, 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 the color comes alive. If it recognizes uh, people are happy, for instance, it creates a very smooth um, ripple of movements from inside out. And if it recognizes that people are angry, then it moves uh, tremble really fast as though it's um, avoiding people to get closer to, to the person. So basically, if your eyes are closed and if you're the wearer or if you're blind, basically, by just hearing um, the movement of the color around your head, you can recognize where people are standing as well as what kind of emotions they're expressing through their facial expressions. So I just uh, played the actual video and I won't talk over it.
The debate um, about the gaze and surveillance from narrow as well as cognitive perspective, um, as well as critical feminist perspective really is fascinates me. I want to emphasize that in my the rest of my presentation, when I talk about gaze, um, I use gaze and surveillance in an interchangeable um, way. In a way, uh, the gaze of the machine or the gaze of the human are inter interchangeable concepts. Basically, um, our gaze um, is a way that we perceive the world from our environment. Um, basically, um, our gaze is um, biased. We basically don't um, just observe any, in any information from our environment just randomly, but we actually um, uh, have a preference in how where we look and how we receive the information from our environments. And when we are talking about uh, the, the bias in our gaze, this would take us back to obviously the work of John Berger, Ways of Seeing, where he argues that historically men um, um, have been have been portrayed as though they're allowed to examine women while women must continually watch themselves. And then this would further take us to the historical concept of Panopticon, which refers to a type of institutional, uh, institutional building um, and system of control envisioned by um, British philosopher Jeremy Bentham in 18th century. Um, and later on, um, Michel Foucault, a French philosopher, basically revitalized the interest into the notion of Panopticon in his book, Discipline and Punish. Um, and I think what is really fascinating about this example of Panopticon is that rather than an external action, um, the gaze of the watcher is internalized in the prisoners to such an extent that they start kind of observing or watching their own um, activities. And this internalized um, asymmetrical gaze could be seen in the work of Laura Mulvey, as also David mentioned in the work that uh, she did on the male gaze, where she claims that the male gaze serves to depict women as objects of pleasure for the heterosexual male viewer. What if women were to subvert this through the power of their gaze? Could we draw open surveillance technologies to allow women to know which part of their body is being looked at? Um, this piece um, that I'm going to show is equipped with a facial tracking camera that can see where the onlooker is looking. And based on onlookers and gaze, um, the variable start to move um, accordingly. If you're basically the wearer, you um, know which part of your body is being looked at because you feel the haptic pressure on your body. If you're on look here, you know that your action has been notified um, because you see the movement on the other person's body. So basically, this really changed the social interaction. And the aim is to really um, see how a uh, sort of um, gaze could be acting here as a form of, or surveillance could act as a form of uh, uh, resistance strategy. Oh, sorry. These are um, intriguing historical masks um, worn by Bandari women from southern part of Iran. Um, le legend has been said that these masks were developed during uh, Portuguese colonial rule as a way of protecting the wearer from the gaze of um, a slave master looking for attractive women. So um, the project that I'm going to show is inspired by this mask. I was really fascinated by the design of this mask, uh, but they also covered the entire face except the eye. 
So I was wondering how eyes could be used as um, a strategy for communication. In that, I came across an interesting in incident where um, uh, American um, uh, American soldier uh, um, Ad Admiral Jeremy Denton linking the word torture using the Morse code during his captivity in Vietnam. No, well, I don't know what uh, is happening, but uh, whatever the position of my government is, I support it fully. Well, whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that government. I mean, obviously, the use of the code is nothing new uh, for communication. In fact, during this lockdown, we see that women have developed uh, signals for, for asking for domestic abuse during the, the lockdown. And these ideas, um, as well as um, the new recent advancement in AI, uh, Facebook AI Lab, uh, was really inspiring. Uh, sorry, do you see my screen okay? Yeah, I do, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to make sure. So this yeah. project was really fascinating um, because um, during this project at Facebook AI Lab, uh, the scientists they were trying to basically do an experiment where two AI bots um, can develop or negotiate between one another. During the act of negotiation, however, these, these bots start to develop a sort of a language by repeating words that no one can actually understand what they're doing. Scientists um, felt very uncomfortable and they had to stop the, these and um, basically intervene with the algorithm and stop the algorithm from running to make sure this is not happening in future. I mean, obviously, this story could also reveal that knowledge is power and inability to, to, to understand would unnerve those who wish to maintain their authority. So all these sort of layers uh, was really inspired me to think about how we could develop a new type of um, uh, mask um, or niqab for these women that uses machine learning algorithm um, using the text um, source article Candace Abalton Speak by the feminist theorist Gayatri Spivak um, in order to communicate and send and receive messages. Uh, Spivak, in her article, asked whether it might be possible for the colonized or the subaltern to have a voice in the, in the face of colonial oppression. So uh, we used machine learning algorithm uh, using Markov chain to create a text that it was trained based on her seminal article. Um, when you're using this system, we represent each word as a state and that the transition as a likelihood that a specific letter or word go after another. So the system basically keeps generating letters one after another, and it's keep evolving as it's doing that. Each of the words that is generated through the system, then it translates to a Morse code and then um, uh, send to uh, the eyelashes that um, exist on the surface of these masks. So basically each of the eyelashes, they send and receive messages from the opposite mask. So in the video documentation, you see that, um, that that's, that's what's happening between um, the women. The aim is really to sow anxiety between patriarchal system by developing a new language that unnerves um, patriarchal oppressor and give voice, hopefully, to, to subaltern. So I'm going to run the video without me talking over.
2020, um, Black Lives Matter protester Samantha Franson actually stares down a racist Trump supporter. And this is the, the moment that captured that. This really kind of prompted me to think about uh, ways that women could basically use their power of their gaze um, and the politics that involve in that, uh, that gaze also um, as, a, as a landscape that can uh, reverse the gaze back uh, back to the, um, to, the, to, the, to the viewer. Um, might women uh, be able to use technology this time to return their gaze? So I was invited by the fashion house Anakiki for uh, to do a um, installation for a runway show for the Milan Fashion Week um, last February. Now, fashion is really fascinating. Fashion is an important medium for production of culture. Yet, fashion industry has been very complicit in the uh, within the tradition of female objectification and sexual harassments. Women's bodies are regularly objectified within this uh, industry. So I was wondering how we could use technology to kind of subvert um, and uh, sort of return the gaze of um, the, the model back to the, to the audience. So um, the, the piece is consists of um, a, a person who is standing in the center, a model who is wearing this Custom made um, headpiece. Um, the headpiece is equipped with two small cameras, um, and the the, the uh, hair eye movement is basically captured and in real time streamed to these four industrial robotic arms that be located on her back. The idea was creating this sort of uncanny feeling of being watched by extended gaze of the model back to the audience. really fascinating about this uh, was also the moment that people uh, after the installation is finished um, um, basically after the show this was 15 minutes show uh, and the guests all came uh, and they were basically taking pictures of uh, and videos of this whole uh, scenario and so it was like this moments of observer being observed uh, by these four extended um, robotic arms, so it was a really fascinating moment. And how could I talk about the male gaze and not talk about Iran, my home country? As we see, the, the repression of women's identity as a form of patriarchal dominance over women, which led to widespread protest in the last uh, year and a half. And the tragic story of protesters, uh, especially young protesters in Iran, who got permanently blinded as they shot in the eye by authorities and military forces using rubber bullets. That was really tragic stories that I uh, witnessed. Um, and uh, I re very soon realized that this is not just uh, in Iran. In fact, around the world, from Hong Kong protesters to Kashmir in India, to in fact in 2020 in US uh, during the Black Lives Matter, at least 23 people got permanently blinded. To Chile, where 230 people um, got lost their sights um, when they protested uh, or demonstrated over inequality and poor social services. So this story keep repeating all around the world. And I was one I, I was really um, thinking about ways that I could um, address this. Um, how could how could we use victims' gaze 
to address the, the, the importance of nonviolence means of political expression and basically holding authorities and government accountable for the, their violent action. These are living evidence of uh, people who lost their um, sight permanently just for the act of speaking out um, or uh, um, asking for their own rights. So I did an immersive installation, which I'm gonna very briefly just show that. <laughs> Um, the question of gaze um, and bias is obviously not a straightforward. Um, and, and I think, especially as we see the more sort of acceleration in utilization of AI tools, we can see that how uh, some of the biases that we have, it could be uh, so deeply internalized in our culture, in our traditions, in our political situations. And really to understand those biases, we really have to dig deeper into our hidden layers of uh, sort of uh, biases that we have engraved in ourselves. And maybe to kind of wrap up uh, my talk, um, I can say that as an Iranian American um, artist and designer, um, I really see the role of these new technologies to um, revisit some of these critical issues such as a male gaze in a novel way. I see the role of technology to ask questions um, and uh, challenge dominant outlooks rather than sort of answering problems for the hope of more um, peaceful future. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, it's it's amazing your work and i'm i'm like every time i see it whether i'm on you know looking at your website or seeing it now i'm kind of I, it's weird i feel like i'm seeing it for the first time it's got this uncanny feeling about it that um it just kind of feels it hits a little different every time i look at it um and i think one of the things about it is and you kind of you kind of address this initially <clears throat> when you you're kind of introducing the talk that one of the things you're really interested in is movement, right? Movement itself is just, it's, it's another element of design that I think is often overlooked. But, I, you know, I teach motion design and, and uh, motion graphics. So I'm always kind of thinking about movement and, and how it in conveyance, like how it conveys movement. Um, it, can, it conveys empathy, emotion. You were talking about it conveying something is alive versus inanimate. Um, and I also, the, I think the, the key thing that you were looking at was iridescence, which re kind of requires movement, right? Especially in nature, but even in your piece, um, if, it's, if it isn't moving, the whole idea of iridescence doesn't really work. It needs to, it requires like, even if it's just like an oil slick on a, on a puddle, you need to, you don't notice it until you're moving, right? So you have to sort of be alive to see it and, um, but I think it's, um, the, well, the other thing I was gonna say is that I'm, I'm also a technologist, right? So I'm always, I'm looking at your work and it's, it, what you're trying to convey is very immediate and, and you've kind of reduced all the, the, ambival the uh, you know, the ambiguity, like it's really pretty, pretty clear what you're doing. So my questions are really more like, how did you do it? For example, you, you were using software to, in in a couple of your pieces, to monitor audience presence and to detect faces 
and and not just detect faces, but to detect um, you know emotional conveyance on the face. Can you talk a little bit about what the software you use? Because you were using microcontrollers. What what kind of software do you use to do that and and have it be that immediate? Mm -hmm. So. Um... I mean, project by project in general varies in terms of like the technology that I use. So sure. I, for me, it's also like a lot of time, like learning, like, oh, what technology is available? What kind of sensor mm -hmm. is available? What are the mm -hmm. available softwares that it's open yeah. source? Right? Yeah, and it's open source, like, yeah. Yeah, like basically which library you would take. So it's partially yeah. like being really open to like yeah. what possibilities are out there and how much you feel almost, um, leave yourself a little vulnerable to feel yeah. like okay, I have no idea about this, but I'm right. interested and I'm curious and I want to learn yeah. it. Um, yeah. So um, in terms of a lot of like, you know, projects that for instance, uses facial tracking, a lot of time was using um, a, either libraries that it has models of facial tracking. So we didn't train the facial tracking models ourselves. But yeah. we use existing systems which already trained with facial tracking, gaze tracking, facial expression tracking. And then now you can question, right? You can question yeah. that on which type of data this, this system has been trained, which I think is really interesting territory yeah. in terms of, for instance, <clears throat> caress of the gaze uses uh, gaze tracking, but also gender tracking. Like it says you're male or female. And it's like we know that gender is... Um, not represented it's like expected yeah spectrum it's, it's yeah informative, yeah um, uh, according to judith butler so how do you how, how do you even have systems that is so binary and say that oh this is male or female so although i use a lot of existing um trained models such as you know gender tracking gender tracking for instance i'm very well aware of the limits or blind spots of these systems too yeah i try to address them in wherever i can now um a lot of time using those systems then uh using arduino or microcontrollers mm -hmm. yeah so you have to constantly evolve what programming language even you use um so just to very uh, pragmatically answer your question a lot of yeah. time projects varies from using various uh, coding language from javascript using let's say p5.js which is an amazing right. community of creative yeah. uh, coding platform um, sure. that i encourage all the students to definitely get engaged with the community um it's very easy to use it's for artists to use uh, coding language uh, mm -hmm. As well as, you know, um, Unity, C sharp in Unity to to um, to C um, in Arduino. So Arduino itself has its own language. So a lot of time, according to the project, we piece and put together yeah. various yeah. programs to convey a concept. So gotcha. usually it's what we want to achieve. And then we try to work with the limitation of what we have. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. I think also now to like get a little bit more theoretical, because I'm really nerdy and I'm into like coding and stuff like that. So I, I think I want to like peep under the hood a little bit. But you, it was it's interesting because we had a lecture series now, I want to say a year and a half ago that was all about the eye. And we talked, I talked to like a, a researcher who looked at eye tracking, um, who many artists who who looked and and it really had had a critical eye towards uh, surveillance and how surveillance is used. And and Michel Foucault came up a lot as well as well as the Panopticon. So it's kind of ironic that you launched right into this. Um, and it kind of, you know, I think the thing about Foucault that was startling to me or that really just made me understand things differently is that he, he, theorize that we are in a self-imposed panopticon right and we're all looking at each other social media has only sort of elevated this uh where we're all watching each other so there's no need for the the literal panopticon we have one in our brains we have one in our society um and we're all watching each other and therefore we're afraid to sort of step out of any any line um and that's why 
and with, uh, like I said, with technology, this has become only more uh, prevalent, right? Because the technology, it's like an immediate eye that's literally surveilling us that we're in control of. Uh, we provide the data, like you, you don't need like a, a tech giant collecting our data and our images and, and then selling them because we're doing it ourselves. We're providing the content, right? But I think, um, I think it cuts both ways because you were you showed a picture of like uh, a a young woman staring down a Trump supporter, and it got me thinking about. Which is a great image, by the way, but it got me thinking about January sixth. Uh, it's two thousand twenty one when thousands of irate Trump supporters stormed the Capitol, tried to affect a coup, essentially, right? I mean, it's, I'm not going to beat around the bush, right? And they, at the very, at best, they tried to stop um, the proceedings of an election, right? And what's interesting is that after that happened, because they were all filming each other using Telegram, using Twitter, uh, Instagram, et cetera, they were generating all this content. And there's this, as you probably have heard about this, this is online project of, um, independent people who are not only collecting all this stuff and have not only collected all the, the social media content, but they've triangulated it in such a way that they can tell where it was shot by not just by like, by metadata, they can tell like the, you know, where in the capital they were at the time. And then they can see basically a three dimensional picture of where everyone was uh, while this was happening through time. It's like fascinating that this can even be done. Uh, but on paper, it makes sense, right? That like, yeah, I guess if you have the time and the technology, this can be done. And it's actually led the Justice Department to actually find a lot of these people, find their social media accounts, find out where they were, prove they were there in court. And then, of course, now we know this is now over two years later, two and a half years later, people are going to prison for decades for this. So mm -hmm. it's it's been a fascinating journey as an American to see this happen. Uh, but as an artist and a technologist and someone who is aware of Foucault, it's it's also kind of interesting and fascinating to see the gaze be used as a force for good. And I was mm -hmm. hoping like maybe you could you could talk about that. Like your work is, and we and this is why I invited you here to, to criticize the male gaze and to elevate the female gaze and what, and look at the power dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. But in as a broader picture, could you maybe talk about what, what happens now, like in the future, not just with gender politics and power structures, between men and women and other in other genders, but what where do you see this all kind of leading us into the future as surveillance becomes more not just prevalent but more accepted maybe, and we're doing more of it ourselves? Does that make sense? Hmm. No, it was a fascinating um, question, and and a lot of things you said, I I, mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. I mean, there is, I mean, in fact, um, this whole also for me, this started from the moments that. Uh, the media captured George Floyd's death, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that was, what if there was no camera? What if there was yeah. no camera to capture that? What would have you happened? You would never know. Been another, another, another death yeah. that was uh, basically uh, dismissed and forgot <laughs> in the history or just another one, right? Yeah. All of a yeah. sudden capturing that a moment, um, Having the, the 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 viewer capture that moment, we see that the camera become a tool, um, the surveillance, the gaze of the person become a tool yeah. for a larger social, political uh, protests, right? And yeah. move, um, so so it's fascinating uh, when you look at the power of these tools. Um, at the same time, I, I agree with you that usually surveillance also is being viewed as either good or bad right there yeah, are so yeah. many arguments about like oh surveillance is horrible like it's causing us like look ca like corporates are capturing our data or doing yeah. this, or like basically surveillance is doing this horrible thing to our societies yeah. and then on the other hand there are the other camps that they're saying that no 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 look surveillance like if you have a camera in a dark street it can lead to safety and security for families yeah yeah there's this truth camp of like uh, and they're always like hating one another and like there's arguments similar argument is for the use of ai there are yeah. two very sort of dark side and uh, bright sides of the use of ai i just feel that um we should avoid um sort of 
going to these two extremes to see them as black and white, uh, to see them as this ty type of, oh, the, the, the tool itself is horrible or is good in of itself is really a question of how are we using these tools? Where yeah. are we using, in which context we are using it? Um, who is benefiting from those data? So like these type of question has become really important questions to have rather than putting the general sort of assumptions that oh, yeah. yes, science is horrible or AI use is horrible, AI is gonna take our job. Instead of doing those type of generalized uh, sort yeah. of arguments, we really have to see nuances of yeah. where and in which context and how it's been used. Um, you know, a knife can be a cutting tool for an apple, yeah. or it can be a murder tool. Um, um, yeah. How are we yeah. using it? Um, is the question. Yeah, this occurs to me too with Iran because you know, in you know, the Arab Spring really couldn't have happened without the use of technology and and like WhatsApp and and you know, encrypted texting technologies and location data, all the stuff that is used for surveillance can also be used to take a, a group of people and actually do something about, you know, uh, an authoritarian government. Uh, Masa Amini comes to mind too, because I mm -hmm. feel like I remember when she was murdered and there was a, there were multiple protests in mm -hmm. Iran and throughout the world. Americans are hearing about it because all our comment sections are blowing up with you know hashtags for Masa Amini and and the and they all lead to content. So it's almost like here's social media, which traditionally homogenizes things, being used to or can ha, has the the downside of homogenizing and mixing over things, suddenly being subverted just by simple you know comment sections and interaction with people to to really just draw attention to her her death. So I think yeah. there there is like a it, it, it tool and how we use it matters. Is it, you know, I had a discussion with a student just the other day about this, that he was equating AI to another, a thing that was gonna become sentient and then occupy the same space as us and perhaps be at odds with us. And I'm thinking, well, it's a little more complicated than that because AI doesn't exist without us and we don't exist, you know, potentially without our tools, right? That's what defines humanity in some ways is our ability to use tools. So it's it's not fair to distinguish it or, or anthropomorphize it into a separate entity. So I think that's like another way to talk about AI. Um, one other, I do have another question too. Um, well, I have lots yeah. of questions, but another question I have is your work is, I mean, it's, it's very brainy and very heady. Like it has a lot of ideas and concepts and they're, but they're like beautifully executed. I mean, they're just crafted well. So, you know, and I know you have, you're, you're a, you have an architect background, but, but you must have some kind of like fashion bound, right? I mean, it's just beautiful, fashionable style, you know, it's very stylish work that you do. Have you have any sort of no, no, or no fashion background indeed. Um, in fact, a lot, most of my work got attention from fashion. Like that was like yeah, Press of the Gays was the piece that put me on the map. Um, because it was like the concept was something that I realized that it touched up in something for the first time was male gaze on the female yeah. body. The use yeah. of facial tracking, gaze tracking technology. So it got like so much attention. And then it was, as you said, it was beautiful as an object. So it got yeah. attention and it was very fascinating for me as a designer to observe that. Uh, but uh, honestly, I never, mm, yes. And then after that project, I get more attention from the fashion world. I was like, get, yeah. keep getting either commissions or opportunities to work with fashion industry more and more. And people gradually started thinking I'm a fashion designer, but I actually mm -hmm. have zero training on fashion. Um, so for me, it's a knowledge of 3D and um, sort of like architectural design that I yeah. apply it to a wearable and fashion scale. In fact, I co-edited an issue of architectural design magazine called right. 3D Printed Body Architecture because yeah. I noticed that a lot of architects now are starting to, to apply these ideas from architecture for, uh, scale to fashion scale. To fashion, yeah. Was uh, 3D printing. A lot of time 3D printing is very limited in terms of like how big you can print. 
So mm -hmm. architects end up being like, okay, I can 3D print, you know, something like human size a scale. Yeah. And the most crazy ideas that we have, it can sometimes like you have to wait your entire life to actually build it in as a building a structure, but then you can apply it to human body. So for me, it was like mm -hmm. that sort of um, accessibility that yeah. I can make some of my ideas on the human body. But then because of this sort of very um, intimate uh, yeah. distance, between the objects around the human body, then you can tap into perception, to critical issues, to feminism in a very one-to-one. -one, uh, yeah, it's it's a great. I, I mean, it's a really brilliant way and an entree into this world. Uh, that said, since you don't have a formal, you know, fashion background, how much do you think the fashion world is sort of inextricably tooled for the female gaze for like passive? viewing for the male gaze and and part b of that question is how can it be sort of practically reconfigured to address the things that you're doing i mean the the the, the female gaze piece that you showed is amazing it's beautiful but you couldn't wear that out on the street right so uh mm -hmm. or not yet but but how do you see um how how sort of ossified is fashion right now in terms of passive being passively viewed and where could it possibly go to be more empowering and really address this idea of the gaze in a positive way yeah i think um again like because it's not my like immediate territory it's very difficult mm. to know what exactly but i mean observing the fashion movements in runway shows you can see that there is a lot of movements around you know, either uh, sort of uh, against the objectification of the female body yeah, to yeah. movements on sustainable design and um, things like that. It is happening on runway shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I have to also say that in general, in my design practice, I am more interested in sort of a speculative um, sort of future it's a one-off object it's not mass customized mass produced right. items yeah um, so i'm i'm less interested in the business parts of thing to make an object <laughs> that i can mass produce and actually sell and make a business out of it but yeah. i'm more interested in, in conversation in creating visions for um how these technologies could be integrated into design and art in order to address like you know, in order to provoke conversation, yeah, to spark yeah. imagination rather than going to actually like production of ready to wear item. So from sure. that perspective, I, I I feel like my fashion work land itself more into sort of runway shows or sort of hot couture, uh, something that is more futuristic, something that is more one off. And it's not necessarily for right now today, wear it and go to the street. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, one last question. I think that's all we have time for. There's this. There's this article. It's like an opinion piece, really, in the New York Times um, from their their cultural critic Jason Frago. And I just have a quote here. It's got a lot of stuff in it, but the one quote that stuck out to me is is as follows: Our museums, studios, and publishing houses can bring nothing new to the market except the very people they once systematically excluded. Which is, in other words, to say that the reason, um, right now, for the last four to five years, that we're seeing a lot of uh, women artists, women of color, people of color artists, not just in the art world, but but in the literary world, in the fashion world, we're seeing them represented in television and film. We're seeing them represented more because of, um, first of all, the prerogative to be more. Um, have a more diverse representation, right? There's a social prerogative, but also because claims uh, Jason Frago, we're sort of like in the death of culture. We have nothing new. We're like churning out, you know, reproductions of things, and we're we're not really making new, which has been the sort of hallmark of modernism for over 150 years now. We're no longer doing that. So the only new stuff is stuff that we've been not showing. So my, <laughs> I don't know if I agree with this. However. He, there, there is some truth to it. And my question for you would be, are you concerned at all that the art world is only sort of looking now towards inverting the gaze 
solely in its quest for new content. Um, is this a concern for you or do you see this as like a really legitimate and honest uh, thing that's happening in, in the world of art and just even external to that where we're really interrogating the gaze? How do you feel about this? Wow. I know it's a, it's, it's a big one, I know. <laughs> that's a really big question. And I feel like I'm <laughs> going to ponder on this one for a few days, actually. <laughs> but I think uh, your question is so spot on. I mean, it, is it, it, is it uh, for production of new content or is it yeah. a genuine uh, request? I think, again, it's like how, uh, I, I think the question of inclusivity and diversity within in different institutions is very interesting. I mean, what we see yeah. in America a lot of time, it also end up being the sort of, um, I mean, Sarah Ahmed, um, literally thinker, she talks about how uh, this notion of diversity within institution become this sort of a disguise for yeah. hiding racism, right? Yeah. So I'm yeah. simplifying by saying that, oh, now we are having these check boxes and therefore yeah. we can continue yeah. being continuing the racism yeah. yet you're checking all these boxes or is this really a genuine um i think it's a very complex one and i'm afraid that i'm not able to answer this question uh, <laughs> but okay. i feel that um i feel that it's it's um it's important one it's important mm -hmm. to be given voices to yeah. those that who ha didn't like historically been marginalized or yeah. oppressed, um, either for genuine, like genuinely for giving them opportunity for 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 producing content or platform or a space to just yeah. You know, um, and I think uh, yeah, from that perspective, I think um, no matter if it's genuine or not, we want. Yeah. To have those voices in i yeah i agree i mean that makes a good point it's like it doesn't really matter what the whether it's genuine or not it doesn't matter what where it's coming from as long as it's happening um it's it's progress right so exactly. thank you so much minaz this has been great i mean you've i mean you've given me a lot to think about um and i promise i'll ask everyone that same question it won't just be you but thank you so much for meeting with us today um thank you. Everybody can go. Day. Yeah, it was incredible to see your work. Um, and we'll be posting this online so everyone can get your work and look at your website. Uh, thank you so much. And please do have a good day, okay? Thank you. You too. Thank you. All everyone. right. Bye. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.